Hi there. Welcome to the Sober Circle channel. Enjoy this speaker tape. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. My name is Maurice Zolotow, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Maurice. And I thank the committee, Martin and Kathy and everybody, for inviting me to come down here and share with you, and, and Jim for meeting me in Durango. Had I known that he was interested in horses last night, I could have... Uh, could have talked about handicapping for a bit. I've written four books since I... I've published three books since I sobered them. One, two, three. Yeah, I've written five, but you don't publish everything you write. And uh, one of them that came out about three or four years ago was called Confessions of a Racetrack Fiend. Oh, <laughs> there's more yet. It's a long title, How to Pick a Six and my other secrets of handicapping for the weekend handicapper. So, uh, I even know a little bit about horses. And uh, I never, I never uh, bet on horse races while I was drinking. It was one of those things I didn't have time for, among others. There were many of them, but uh, that, that was a... I hate to call it a fringe benefit of sobriety, because usually fringe benefits are supposed to be noble spiritual things, you know. And now that I know we have a... A voice in the back, he's like, I'm a fear at any moment of interruption, saying, is that your idea of a fringe benefit, sir? And I don't know what's going to come. And I'm trying to be prepared uh, for everything. The French say I'm going to be end God. And um, um, so I'm, I love to be here. And uh, I, I do want to digress for a minute. This is an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And... Nicotine is certainly not uh, the subject, but since Kendall brought up the smoking and it was di was discussed at the uh, nine o'clock meeting that Mickey spoke at so eloquently, and uh, I believe Hunt and Charlie, who were I forget the titles they had, chairman and introducer or vice versa, both mentioned smoking half jocularly and the difficulties getting over. There's a there was a uh, a no smoking section and one of the sinners emitting clouds of of killer fumes, but it, I shouldn't say these pejorative things about people because I was a heavy smoker myself until a few years ago, and and um, I would have let it all go by because we're supposed to talk about alcoholism, and I will eventually. But, uh, when Elsa spoke about uh, her, about Chuck, a man whom I loved and who, when I was a newcomer, by the way, I, uh, through the grace of God and the, this program and the steps and the sponsor and the fellowship, I have been sober since February 17, 1971, and I'm very grateful for that. And my life has changed in many ways. And uh, when I was, when I was new, uh, Chuck Chamberlain's not only what he said but his very appearance bodied forth the beauty of AA if he had stood up for 50 minutes and not said anything but just stood there staring and chuckling he had a kind of a funny chuckle that came he'd say something that didn't strike me at all funny and then he'd laugh at his own funny remark <laughs> if he'd just done nothing but that it would have been inspiring and then now, the thing about smoking and emphysema and the other things that come with it, there are many other diseases, it isn't only that it kills you, because we're all going to die sooner or later. I imagine. The statistically, I think that's a, a strong <laughs> chance of that. Some may live forever, some sitting here. We don't know that. I don't want to... We mustn't be too dogmatic. I've learned that in my age. But it's, it, 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 it weakens your life years before... Symptoms of emphysema shop. There's enfeeblement. There's, it affects the mind and the body, and it's a slow degenerative process. Now, I haven't had a cigarette since July 4th, 1982. Uh, I, I'm able to stay smober. We call it smobriety, by the way. <laughs> I've been able to say stay smober through a little group that that we started in Santa Monica, a part of Los Angeles. Greater Los Angeles, Santa Monica, and it's Smokers Anonymous. I wrote an article about it. It was published in the Reader's Digest back in, I think, April or May 1985. 
and Jim and I, it's one of the subjects we talk about, talked about in the way down, the uh, smoking and what it does to us. And I'm going to send him a reprint of the article, and perhaps he'll start a, a local chapter of Smokers Anonymous right here in Farmington. I hope so, because uh, uh, I... Uh, look, I was I was uh, a slave of nicotine myself, and and today I only have 50 percent of my lung capacity. But I wouldn't have been able to speak at AA meetings or do anything else with my life if I hadn't stopped smoking just about six years ago. So I would I hope that Mickey and Charlie and Hunt, the three people that are just embarking on this uh, adventure of not smoking, will continue not smoking, and you're going to find it's as, almost as great a life enhancer as not drinking. And now um, I'll talk about alcoholism and what it does to people and what it did to me. Uh, June 1st is a particularly significant day in my life, and it just took place a few days ago, Wednesday of this week was the 1st of June. June 1st was uh, was the day Marilyn Monroe was born. And uh, <laughs> I uh, was involved with Marilyn Monroe as a biographer, as a journalist. I knew her. And I pub published, I uh, wrote and published the first book length biography about her when she was still alive. It came out in 1960. And uh, it's become a classic among people who collect books about film people, and she would have been 62 years old if she hadn't died in um, 1962. She would have been 62 years old this past Wednesday. And when I wrote the book, of course, I was a full-fledged alcoholic myself, and I was also a pillhead. I was uh, heavily addicted to second all. I drank at least a fifth of scotch every day, and I might have taken from four to six second alls every day. So that's a pretty heavy addiction. And it must have been one of the reasons I was able to relate to Marilyn, because even though she was alive, when I read the book now, I see so many instances that show I empathize with her drinking, because I mentioned her drinking, I mentioned her pill taking, I mentioned her suicide attempts all through her life. And I understood her, even though from one point of view, we were far removed from each other uh, in, in ge geography, in sex, in age, uh, and in numerous other ways, of course. And yet, deep down, I think we're both alcoholics and we relate to each other. And my book is going to be republished probably in 1989 by a great big New York publisher called Harper and Row. And in the last few weeks, I've been preparing... The, the original text will be published verbatim, but I'm preparing several hundred extra pages of all the things that I've thought about and developed over the last 26 years since her death. So even on the Friday morning when I was getting ready to come to Farmington, I was writing several, about six, seven pages about Marilyn. And so she's very fresh in my mind as I'm speaking to you. And I know now that if she had been able to surrender and come to Alcoholics Anonymous, we would have had a we would have had many, many great films and a great human being. Perhaps her third marriage might have been saved. Perhaps she might have remarried her second husband, Joe DiMaggio, the great ball player who loved her fervently and deeply who never has never gotten over her death. Uh, I, we don't know what might have happened, but um, she stands to me as a great uh, example of the terribly destructive uh, effects of alcoholism because when she died, either as an accidental overdose or as a deliberate suicide, we cannot be sure. In fact, that's one of the things I'm writing about. Uh, people were looking for all kind of reasons. Well, she was having trouble with the studio. She was, had trouble with her third marriage. She got divorced with Arthur Miller. She was having fights with Clark Gable. They were, had just finished shooting the Misfits up in um, 
Let's see, I should know offhand. Utah, I think. Some place where it's very high, some high desert country. It might have been Nevada. It was Nevada. And um, uh, that did it. And, uh, but we know, alcoholics, I know now that suicide or dying that way is irrational and has nothing to do with external circumstances. I drank heavily when everything went well. I drank heavily when everything went bad, and I drank heavily when nothing much happened, because I drank. That was had become a very big activity in my life, drinking. Same way I write. The reason I'm a writer is uh, because I'm a writer. I've been a writer since I was about 14 or 15 years of age, probably 14, and I was going to a public school in New York City. Most of the teachers at that era... And by the way, I was 74 years old on my last birthday, and um, I'm still a full-time writer and producing more now at 74 than I was producing while I was a raging alcoholic at 44. It's true, when I uh, try to walk up a steep hill, I feel 74, but I tell you this, when I sit down to the typewriter, I feel 24. So it's... Um, and I... Had, have to give the credit to a power greater than myself, and I hate to use the phrase because I choose to call God as if people have a big choice. Well, you can call him God, uh, a tree. Somebody mentioned uh, that, I guess it was Elsa, about somebody who couldn't believe in a higher power, but she saw a big tree growing outside, so she decided the tree would be her higher power. Well, the Druids, actually, the Druids of ancient England, worship trees. Um, but I uh, believe in an all-powerful and all-beneficent God, spelled G-O-D. Same way Chuck Chamberlain spelled him. And, uh, and through this power and, the fel and, and, and the, well, through the fellowship, my, not only was my life given back to me, but I got a new lease on life. The landlord, of course had certain terms in the new lease that weren't in the old lease because I, I was thrown out of the old apartment for making a mess, breaking furniture, uh, making the lives of my spouse and children miserable, and just wrecking the joint generally and bringing down the neighborhood. And uh, uh, when I got back, uh, I did have to live on a different level. I like the thing, uh, things Mickey said about... Uh, and I feel the same when I feel the same way that uh, I can't live my life on the old basis. Just staying sober isn't enough. I have to try to be honest. I have to try. I'm not married, so I can't say I have to be socially faithful. Uh, socially faithful. Sexually faithful. <laughs> I still have trouble with the word sexually. Uh. <laughs> Well, whenever I used to hear the word social intercourse, and social intercourse can mean what we're doing here, beginning to, I always immediately in my mind it was sexual intercourse. I was sex obsessed uh, for most of my life, but maybe everybody is. I don't know. Sometimes you wonder in the, about the media. But I don't want to digress about sex because I'll never get off it, you know. <laughs> so. Um, So my life was given back to me on a, with a new lease. And uh, so I have tried to live differently than I lived before. And uh, it, as I say, it is just, I've known many people that spurned this gift, knew about it. People try to get, not me, I wasn't in AA then, but people try to get Marilyn to stop drinking and go to meetings. And I know at this moment, personally, at least six world-famous movie actors and television actors, including one of a, of a beautiful sex symbol genre, whose careers and lives were saved by uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, by their membership in Alcoholics Anonymous. One of them is, I just happened to see a few days ago, he was giving me some opinions about an article I'm writing. I'd respect his anonymity. If I even mention his first name and initial, you would know who he was immediately. But he's one of the have 10 or 12 highest-ranking movie stars in Hollywood. So I know 
what this program has done for people. I know what it has done for me. So, um, it's strange. I remember a story suddenly about Chuck. Chuck was sponsoring this woman I just mentioned, who's a world famous. She's a great actress as well as a great beauty. And I had been, the first book I wrote, worked on after I became sober was a biography of John Wayne, whom incidentally, as I recollect, Elsa once taught acting lessons to. Is that correct? Elsa didn't, wasn't, Mr. his name was Morrison then. He was one of her pupils. Anyway, uh, and he was acting in a movie with this woman. And I'd been on location in Mexico making notes for my book. And I had talked to her. And then, by then, I was in AA already. This incident happened about 1973. And I came to AA in late 1970. And she was afraid. And then she saw me at a meeting. And I saw her at a meeting. And she was afraid I'd write something and, and reveal that I was, uh, that she was an alcoholic and Alcoholics Anonymous. That was before the era of the Betty Ford Clinic when anonymity went down the drain. I mean, Jim read this thing by the, you can forget anonymity at the media level. I mean, I'm in the media, so I know it's, it's become a farce. Uh, the, the, uh, Liza M. and Elizabeth T. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that here just to pretend I'm following anonymity, but they publicly tell, tell publications, oh, yes, I'm an alcoholic. I go to AA meetings. So some people tell me it's bringing other people to AA, so maybe it's doing good. But anyhow, at that time, she was very apprehensive. So she spoke to Chuck, and Chuck called my sponsor, the... Pa, the Clancy Immerslin, who was Chuck, was his sponsor, and to far, and the re thing was relayed to me. So I said, uh, Clancy knew I. I said, Clancy, but you know, I wouldn't even think of mentioning it. And I went back to Miss X, and subsequently I've met Miss X on other films she's shot and we've shared. A, a, and I've met her at meetings, and she's lost this nervousness about it, and of course, her life and career have been saved by AA. But we can't mourn about these things. We can't say, why me? I used to, uh, when I was drinking, when I was in the depths, when I saw my marriage cracking up, and I couldn't get, and I was losing my children, and I was getting deeper and deeper and deeper in debt, and... And I, I just was uh, full of the same bitterness and wretchedness that so many are. And I said, why me? But then after I sobered up and a new life began, about the 11th year of my sobriety, I went through an 11th year crisis. Chuck C. did also, by the way. Uh, I don't know if there's an 11 year syndrome or what. My thing began, uh, why me? Well, why was I saved? Why wasn't Marilyn saved? I knew a wonderful man named Ken Purdy, a great authority on cars that Martin and Beverly P. know about. Anybody who's ever collected cars. We were old friends from college days. He was a great writer, a great mind, a great person. And when I was about two, three years sober, he put a bullet through his head. Why, why was Ken's life taken and not mine? And it suddenly, all of a sudden, it was a ten years sobriety began disintegrating. And I began having the old, old Tahitian fantasies. What am I doing this? What is this absurdity I'm living, associating with people who don't drink, who uh, give cakes at meetings like little children with candles on them, and they sing happy birthday to you, and they say the Lord's Prayer. I'm a sophisticated person. I'm a man of the world. I want to go to the South Seas like Gauguin. I used to have a Gauguin fantasy. And brown-skinned maidens and rum drinks. And that's and I really began to go kind of crazy, you know. And then I uh, happened to read, luckily, I, I would have sooner or later shared it with my sponsor, but I was going to tell my sponsor this. I was just going to say, adios, AA, and just go off to the South Sea Islands. Um, then you'd have had another speaker here tonight. Either that, or I'd have, have married, stayed sober, married a Polynesian woman, and you'd have had a, 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 a beautiful, 
dark-skinned lady sitting right next to me, but it didn't work out. I never went there anyway. Still have, I still haven't been to Pango Pango. Um, I read an essay by Bruno Bettelheim. He was a, he's a psychiatrist who was in concentration camps during the war and whose life was spared. I believe Mickey, in his talk this morning, talked about the survivor syndrome. There is such a thing as a survivor syndrome. People that survive crews of bombing planes during World War II, if several were killed and one or two survived, the survivors felt guilty. So I must say, I had guilty feelings, I guess. Because so I've had several friends and acquaintances who took their lives. Uh, among them was a great playwright named William Inge, who wrote Picnic and many other plays. And... Uh, whom I was with the night before he took his life, who would not go to an AA meeting with me. He couldn't stop drinking and taking pills. I was trying to get him to to do both. Anyway, and Bruno Bettelheim uh, wrote a book about survivors, and he just tells of a group of people meeting after World War II, uh, and all feeling guilty. And uh, some had been in concentration camps, and some, some had lost all the members of their family. They were the only ones who survived. And, uh, and this question was raised, why, why, why was I saved and not them? And a woman who had been in the French resistance during the war, and who had seen most of her comrades go down, and die, be killed, and who had survived, said, Perhaps our lives were saved so that the living of our lives would justify the saving of it. And suddenly when I read this, <clears throat> I said, well, that must be why my life was saved. Not to live it in the old way. And even though I was, the gift of writing was restored to me, even not to write in the old way. Not that I write inspirational literature now. I, before I became a heavy drinker, I wrote things about actors and actresses. While I was a heavy drinker, I wrote things about actors and actresses. And when I sobered up, I'm still basically writing the same genre of writing. So it isn't that in that sense, but my feeling about my writing is different, and my feeling about my life is different. My life is here to be a basically of service. Service in AA, service to the people I meet, and not lived selfishly. It's to be lived to the best of my ability altruistically. And when I, I, I try to meditate and pray in the mornings, my praying about my writing is to be of service to my editors, which means turning in a manuscript on time when it's promised, trying to make it accurate and error-free and interesting, and to be of service to the readers. I never used to think about all those things. I used to think of my big fat byline and fame and being in Who's Who in America and all those things. And you know, it's when it's the middle of the night and you're alone and you're terrified and you're frightened and you're a drunk, all these great honors don't mean a damn thing. Because there have been some great, great writers, just to take people in my profession, who've won the Nobel Prize. In fact, most of the first three or four American writers who won the Nobel Prize for literature were alcoholics. William Faulkner, he drank two bottles of uh, Old Forester a day. I know this because his editor at Random House told me that. I was a Random House author on three books. Uh, now, that's pretty good. I have to, as an ex-alcoholic, an ex-practicing alcoholic, I can't help but admire any man from Mississippi that can drink two bottles of Old Forest, that bonded and bond, bonded bourbon, a uh, hundred proof, not bad, uh, and then write the way he wrote. He was one of the greatest American writers that ever lived. He was an alcoholic. Sinclair Lewis, one of our great novelists, who coined the phrase Babbitt. I don't want to give you a course here on American literature. God, will I ever get to my story, what I used to be like, what happened? And, <laughs> that I, uh, that I, this is one long, my talk is turning out to be one long digression. Sinclair Lewis was an alcoholic. Ernest, who? 
Edgar Allan Poe never won the Nobel Prize, man. He was an, may have been an alcoholic and a drug addict. The Nobel <laughs> It's an interesting point, but uh, the Nobel Prize is named for Alfred Nobel, the inventor of trinitrochuanol, or TNT, or dynamite. So he gave prizes for peace, literature, and things like that. <laughs> and I believe the Nobel Prizes were established in 1905, and uh, Edgar Allan Poe, I believe, died sometime in the 1840s, so he could not... He deserved the Nobel Prize. I'll go that far. But, no, another one was, of course, Ernest Hemingway, who put a gun through his head. He also got the Nobel Prize. T.S. Eliot, who's an American who lived in London, was not an alcoholic. He got the Nobel Prize, too. And William Butler Yeats, an Irish poet, who has nothing to do with the sport altogether, but whom I love, <laughs> also got the Nobel Prize. In fact, I saw his grave when I visited Ireland last fall. What I was like, I was born in New York of parents who were not alcoholics, and uh, they didn't smoke either, and they weren't Baptists, by the way, either. <laughs> and they were, were against promiscuous sex. You would think they were some kind of rabid, crazy religious people. They weren't. They were crazy, rabid atheists, they were, and crazy, rabid Marxian socialists. But they were not, uh, they, they thought God and, and religion were... Uh, tools of capitalists and I was brought up that way and not only that they were vegetarian so they would have despised the, well, the <laughs> delicious steak I ate tonight <laughs> and naturally uh, not naturally I might have followed their teachings but very often one rebels against the teachings of one's parent and I early on decided anything they believed in knowing the sort of unhappy, wretched people they were. Because, by the way, those of you that have had alcoholic parents or highly religious parents often think, well, if I'd had nice, free-spirited parents, <laughs> radical parents, my life would have been better. Believe me, they fought just as ne two sober people can fight and have arguments and scream at the dinner table at each other. And... and uh, I used to just be jealous of cousins of mine that were <coughs> religious or friends of mine that went to church and took communion or if they were Jewish were bar mitzvah and I wasn't, didn't have any of these things and uh, I felt very alone and I sought God. I also sought all the things that they preached against. I decided alcohol is a good thing. I began smoking as soon as possible and drinking as soon as possible. And it took a little longer to engage in sex, uh, but as soon as that was possible, I did that. <laughs> and uh, I just didn't think they knew anything about life. And the people I aspired to imitate were people like Ernest Hemingway, who uh, were newspaper men and lived dangerous lives and had mistresses and traveled all over the world. I was going to be a foreign correspondent. I knew I was going to be a writer. There was no choice. I was just, as I say, it was just something I did. I, the reason I'm a writer is I wake up in the morning, I write. <coughs> Excuse me. That's a result of all the smoke that comes in here. And it's made, normally, I wouldn't cough at all. Really, I should get off. It's not nice to say this. Forgive me. It's a, cruel, but I really want to help you smokers to kick this wretched habit and make life better for the non-smokers, too. But um, I was recently in Las Vegas. My son is a uh, professional gambler. He gambles on Wall Street, and he gambles at games of chance in Las Vegas and other places. And we were talking about the fact that Donald Trump is a man who is, he already owns two casinos in Atlantic City. He owns many large buildings in Manhattan, and he builds more buildings. So s several of us were having dinner in Las Vegas, and, and somebody said, no, I said, and he's now building an enormous hotel on the Strip in Las Vegas. That's the main thing there, Las Vegas Boulevard. I put this in because since somebody didn't know when the Nobel Prize started, they might not know what the Strip in Las Vegas is. Uh, the... Uh, and I said suddenly, it's a naive statement, 
I said, why does Donald Trump want to build a big $150 million casino on the Strip? So my son looked at me and said, because he builds buildings, that's why. And it suddenly he says the same reason I gamble, he builds buildings, you write. And I suddenly realized that uh, there are people who are given certain vocations by God, and they do it. Donald Trump wakes up in the morning. If he hasn't got at least one building in process of being built, he starts another. Why does he build buildings? Because that's what he does. He builds buildings. Why do I write? I write because I write. My son likes to pick high-risk uh, stocks in Wall Street because he likes to speculate for large sums of money, and he wins some and loses some. And I think he's worth several million dollars or something. At the moment, he's in the south of France with his lovely wife. And uh, he also goes to the theater and studies Shakespeare. So uh, I don't know. It's, uh, I, I feel my writing was a vocation. So that's, uh, I, that's how I grew up. And uh, lonely, frightened, miserable, uh, looking for escapes. I found escapes in reading. I found escapes in the movies. And I found escape in writing. They were all solitary activities. To this day, I would rather go to the movies alone than with somebody else. It's a strange thing. And uh, I became a solitary person. And, uh, and yet, when adolescence came, I had to seek out and uh, find female companionship. Because, unfortunately, among the things... Uh, I told Jim I don't believe in using any language, not a little, not only obscene language from the lectern. By the way, this is not a podium. It's often mistakenly called a podium. A podium is something people stand on. This is a lectern. Just a little bit of tidbit of knowledge I thought I'd throw at you. So I give educational things, too. So um, I never use... Not only don't I use obscene words from the lectern, but I uh, don't even use words that, you know, are a little, not, a little suggestive. So let me see b to find the right word for this particular practice, which my parents scared me out of and which most male, ma young males engage in sometimes throughout their entire life. They used to call it self-abuse. So figure it out. <laughs> they had put such a prohibition on self-abuse that I was unable to abuse myself until I was well into my 40s. <laughs> As a matter of fact, when I told my first psychoanalyst, no, my second, my first I couldn't tell it to. I didn't have the code. It took four years of psychotherapy, and then when I had the second one, I happened to be a woman, uh, I was able to tell this to. She didn't believe it. She said, I've never heard of such a thing. As we say in psychiatry, 90% of men engage in this activity, and the other 10% are liars. So, um, but anyway, uh, this is, was my situation, and it induced great and desperate needs and hungers. And uh, it wasn't until I began drinking at about 16 or, s or so that my fear of women and intimacy with women was overcome. So alcohol played a very important part of my life. It was a symbol to me. When I went to college at the University of Wisconsin, one of my, it was still prohibition. One of my ambitions actually was to get drunk. I've heard people say, from the lectern that uh, they never wanted to be an alcoholic. Their ambition wasn't to be an alcoholic. I can truthfully tell you that one of, one of my ambitions, it was, wasn't my major ambition, was to be an alcoholic because I felt that went along with the profession I was going to be in, to be an alcoholic. Another one, of course, was to have a mistress. And, but I can remember one of the first things I did at college was find out where the speakeasies were. They were on the other side of the tracks. Nobody had cars. It was the bottom of the depression of the 1930s. And 
I and two friends walked, got drunk. I sang loudly and made a big disturbance in the streets, and I was arrested. I was put in jail twice in my freshman year. It's my only record as a drunk. I never was arrested for drunkenness again, but uh, maybe I acted more discreetly. So it was a very serious thing. I was very proud of being in jail and being a drunk. And I was becoming everything my mother and father didn't want me to be, and I felt good about that. Uh, and I fell in love with a woman. I thought I, well, I would my plans for myself, that who I would marry, not till much later in life, not until I had at least one French mistress and one Italian mistress. And uh, I fell in love in my junior year with a girl who came from North of Virginia, and we had a stormy four-year courtship because her parents didn't like me. And we finally got married and uh, began a long careening relationship of an alcoholic with a Al-Anon personality. She's a perfect Al-Anon personality. I only understand from hearing men married to Al-Anons talk about them. She's a martyr. She's still living, by the way. And she's an arranger and a controller and... Uh, <laughs> Always in the right, never, never in the wrong, and a wonderful human being, really a thoughtful, considerate, caring, but uh, you have to, anyway, we stayed married a long, long time, 30, 30 years almost, but it was unraveling long before then. We had two children, and uh, I didn't become a serious drinker until I was about 35 years of age. Let me see here now. I've got to remember, my watch is still in L.A. time. So it's about 10 after 8 now, is it? 8? And when am I supposed to stop speaking? At 8.30? Quarter of 9. Quarter of 9, okay. By then, I should have joined AA, I hope. <laughs> I think I'm going to speed up the whole process. Of, I'll get to AA right now. I mean, what is, what is the use of telling you of all these turbulent years of drinking? Because the drinking got really bad when I went to my first psychiatrist. Over, all in all, I went to six of them. Over a period of 20 years, my condition got progressively worse instead of better, to paraphrase chapter 3, I think. And my marriage got progressively worse, and I couldn't handle the material that was turned up. By the way, my first article when I became a, a, a successful journalist on a large scale uh, was when I sold an article to the Sad Evening Post about jazz in Harlem. Jazz was one of my interests. At a, in 1941, uh, the same year that Jack Alexander's famous article on uh, Alcoholics Anonymous appeared in the Sad Evening Post, I was to know the author of that article. He was one of my editors. He was on the staff of the Saturday Evening Post. In fact, I became a regular contributor to the Saturday Evening Post between 1941 and 1963 when I began to give more and more of my time to books. In fact, my, I began giving more and more of my time to books by the 1950s. Anyway, um... I just couldn't handle the things that came out in psychiatry about my parents, about jealousies, about hatreds, and I began drinking, and I drank more and more and more and more until gradually the consumption became <clears throat> at least a bottle a day and martinis and wine with dinner, and, and but always lying to myself that I was a man of the world, a sophisticated drinker. Uh, Ken Purdy we spoke about before was editor of a men's magazine he sent me in various parts of the world to write about alcohol subjects rum I've been to the islands of the Caribbean I've been to southern France northeastern France where Champagne is based the Rhine and Moselle valleys I've been in a lot, lot of parts of the world researching uh, 
articles on alcohol, drinks, and other subjects, too. And uh, anyway, I couldn't handle it. And then I had the second. And I had been faithful to my wife for the first 20 years of our marriage. And I suddenly decided what was wrong with my life because I didn't have a mistress, which is really insane. But So my second psychiatrist, the same woman to whom I told about my terrible deprivation in the area of self-abuse, <laughs> said, well, do you have a particular woman in mind? I said, no, there's no particular woman I have in mind. He said, well, the first step in getting a mistress usually is to have a certain woman. That you... I said, oh, is that the way they do it? Hmm. <laughs> So I, the next, tracked the woman that happened to phone me. She was a publicity woman, phoned me with an idea for a story. I said, um, well, why don't we have lunch and talk about it? So we talked about it, and one thing led to another, and pretty soon I was having an affair with her. And it was very easy. I discovered Manhattan. We were now living in the country. Manhattan, if I start that, I won't get there. Yet. Remember I said I'd give it one minute, and then I got there. But anyway... That led to a whole bunch of affairs and more anxiety and more guilt and more consumption of booze and uh, more interesting amour, too. Let, let's balance the whole thing. And um, uh, But this wasn't, I wasn't cut out to be a Casanova, really. I couldn't do it without feeling terribly guilty and wretched and also feeling more like a man. I just, and lying on a bigger and bigger scale and it's very hard to lie you have to remember what lies you told you have to cover up your tracks actually the easiest softer way is just telling the truth you never have problems with that because the truth is always there and it will readily come to mind And uh, I recommend truth for any of you that are new and want to simplify your life truth is a good way to start and if you don't know something, say, I don't know. Don't make up an answer. And rather than lie, say nothing if you're in a very slippery, ticklish situation. Just, my ex-wife was very great at that. Charlotte was a very quiet person and, and kept secrets to herself. She could give lessons in silence, but she's not. <laughs> she could never go out. She tried one or two Al-Anon meetings after I sobered up, but she didn't, couldn't relate to them. Well, one for one reason, uh, Alanon people have to admit I'm sick too, or it takes two to. And she felt, uh, yes, there was probably she was partly to blame, ten percent maybe or five, and I had the other ninety-five. So anyway, uh, things got worse, and she divorced me. Literally told me to go at one point, and I went. And ultimately, I, uh, we got a divorce, and I came to Los Angeles and had the heaviest year of drinking I ever had, and two mistresses in that last year. So I was trying to follow the mistress. If mistresses were a formula for inner peace and serenity, I would have been the most serene person <laughs> that, ever, that ever lived since, anyway, since Casanova and Don Juan, at least. But it, didn't, it, it may have worked for them. And one of my two last mistresses, believe it or not, the very last one was a nymphomaniac. Because I had a secret conviction that what had always been lacking in my life was a woman of unrestrained uh, <laughs> sexual hungers. And I found one. It's as if God said, well, I'll give you every This is your last option. Now, if this doesn't work, you've got to go to AA, remember. And uh, so he put... Her name happens to be Lois. I swear to God, would you believe that? <laughs> Just like Bill Wilson's wife. And uh, Lois was everything an nymphomaniac is supposed to be, frankly. <laughs> However, there were many other sides to it that books on nymphomania don't explain. She was demanding. She wanted to be driven to things. She had shoes that needed repairing. There were banks she had to make deposit in. She had some children. I forgot See, the person who fantasies an nymphomaniac just thinks of that one tiny little area, the bed. But uh, even, now the average person may spend an hour a day in sexual congress. How's that for a fancy word? <laughs> it applies to many of our legislators in Washington, of course. Come to think of it. An hour a day in sexual congress if he's lucky and virile, but we'll assume that. 
And let's assume if you're with a nymphomaniac, it's three hours a day. But it still leaves a lot of waking hours to fill up. And, I, I, and she was a really an annoyance, a nuisance in those other areas. On the other hand, it's not really nice to criticize all nymphomaniacs because I had a bad experience with one. <laughs> I mean, one shouldn't be bigoted. Open-mindedness. Is, we should be liberal and open-minded. So just let's say it, it didn't work out with Lois. And finally, I had nowhere to go but Alcoholics Anonymous. So I, I, I was still going to my sixth psychiatrist, sixth, S-I-X-T-H. And he knew I had was drinking in the morning. And he said, uh, do you drink every morning? And I said, oh, no, no, just once in a while. And he, nobody knew how much I drank. And he said, well, uh, did you ever think of... No, he said... Um, we talked about it a little bit, and then I suddenly said, do you think Alcoholics Anonymous can help me? I knew about it, of course. Had known since 1941, since I read Jack Alexander and heard about Bill W. and all that stuff. And I said, and he said, maybe. He said, I had a patient who went to AA, and she attended meetings for a few months and never had a drink again and helped her. So I thought, okay. I went out. This was in Westwood Westward part of Los Angeles. I went in there at an office, an AA office in Westward. I went upstairs, collected a bunch of literature, read it that week. I said, uh huh, 12 steps talk about God. I want that. I want God. And I went to my first meeting that Saturday. And it was a strange meeting. And I didn't relate to any of the people. And I felt very defeated at this meeting. And humiliated and cried and I stopped drinking and I went to AA for a couple of weeks no sponsor just went around to meetings and um, just very critical and argumentative and then on February 14th which happened that year was a Sunday this is 1971 and was a Valentine's Day I felt very bitter because I didn't have a valentine. I had a couple of valentines, but in my mind, I had no valentine. My marriage had been a disaster. No woman had ever loved me, starting with my mother. See, one of the awful things that came out in my psychoanalysis was my mother didn't love me. She probably did love me, but they try to, this particular guy and all the successes, I mean, that's part of the whole program. Uh, I don't want to even. I, I have a definite abhorrence of psychiatry and psychoanalysts, and I think they do more harm than good, but that's my prejudice, so I mustn't get into that. Anyway, um, so uh, no woman had ever loved me, and then I went to a memorial meeting for Bill. Wilson had died a few weeks before, and, uh, and here's a man named. Um, his last name was Houston. I can't remember his first name. Uh, and he was a writer, too. And, and I suddenly started being jealous of him. He's a writer. And he was talking about Bill W. and Lois. And I got furious at my Lois and Bill Wilson's Lois and AA. <laughs> oh, God. And I stormed out in the middle of the meeting. It's the only AA, AA meeting I've left in the middle of. And drank for four days and then came back on February 17, 1971 and haven't had a drink since and got a sponsor on March 30th of that year March 30th of that year and I took my sponsor said he would sponsor me only on the basis that I would do everything he suggested without arguing or debating and I, I've tried to follow that and um uh, let me see now in the time that remains if I can tell you some of the turning points in my life, in my AA life. Because it was, as I look back on the progress, it was rapid. At the time, it seemed slow. For example, I thought my memory would never come back. I didn't tell you about the shock treatments I had. I had about 10, 9, 10, or 11 shock treatments. I don't remember the number exactly, but as you know, shock treatments affect the memory. Clancy had 48, by the way. He never failed to point out to me there was nothing wrong with his memory. But at that time, I thought I would never write again. I thought my memory would never come back. Uh, it's pretty good. 
I think you would agree. In fact, friends of mine often call me for dates and names because I have a good memory. But I thought it would never come back. I could barely remember things. I was just fumbling. I was sure I could never write again. I had a contract to write this book on John Wayne, and Simon and Schuster, a very big publisher, and I'd spent and drunk up the $10,000 advance. And I had not written 20 decent pages. And one of the things he told me was to write a letter to my agent and my editor and say I was an alcoholic, and that's why I hadn't fulfilled my contract, but that now I was in the AA, and I would try to do better. And I said, Clancy, if I send that letter, <clears throat> I will never be asked to write anything again. He said, well, you're not going to be asked to write anything again anyhow, because you can't even write, and you're not even writing. So send the letter. It took me, it took me weeks and weeks and weeks. I finally sent those two letters off. And when I mailed them, I knew that my writing life was over, and I would have to find something simple and humble that didn't demand too much energy or intelligence, perhaps working in a nursery. I mean, not a children's nursery, a plant nursery, because the people are laughing. You know, putting plants in earth, maybe. A busboy, maybe. I couldn't even aspire to be a waiter. That would be too demanding. Busboy with sweet floors. I mean, I was really was putting on a disgusting humility act. I mean, it's really... And, um, and I was going to meetings and uh, scrounging around. How I lived, as I look back on it, I don't know. I got one royal back royalty for about $200 a year. I lived on almost nothing. And remember, I had been used to great wealth, great by those two years and what dollars were worth. Many years I had earned $50,000 a year or more. The woman to whom I was married who had become a very successful children's book writer. She's now nationally famous, probably world famous as an editor and writer and has her own logo. In fact, when she divorced me, I used to say this in front of a lot of al ladies, I thought she was a millstone holding me down. Actually, I was at Millstone holding her down. Her career just boomed. It's still booming. She's an executive vice president. She's got, and now when she makes money, she can hold on. And she's a very rich woman, too. We're very nice. <clears throat> We're very good friends. Let me put that in in case I forget later. And whenever I go to New York, I stay at the house which I once lived in and helped make a hell while I was drinking. <laughs> and now it's very nice. We get along beautifully together and uh, give each other a lot of space, as we say in California. Anyway, uh, but at that time there was nothing but bitterness and hatred and all the things that, that there are between people that once loved each other and then hated each other and broke up. And uh, one of the first things I can remember, as I was saying, and she loaned me money during difficult periods. She loaned me a few hundred dollars here and a few hundred night, teeth to be fixed and other people lent me small sums of money that's how I managed to somehow survive and I was always two or three months behind in the rent two or three months behind in the car payment but I went to at least one meeting every night and sometimes a meeting a day and uh, Clancy had been saying you got to go back to your typewriter and whipping me to it and I finally went back to it and tried to write it the words just seemed to crawl, and I, I knew I had lost a gift. Something had been given to me, and I had thrown it away. And um, one day he telephones me. I was about six, seven months sober, I guess. And um, as I was studying the steps, I wasn't working them yet, but one of the greatest things I had done, I felt, was just an unforgivable sin, an unpardonable sin, if you will, was when my poor dear wife was having a hysterectomy she was middle aged and having a hysterectomy I never went to the doctor with her I didn't go to the hospital the day of her surgery and when I because I was busy drinking when I was, finally came the next day and her room was filled with flowers and plants from her admirers and friends many of them and, and illustrators of children's books and writers of children's books or colleagues I made fun of them and I made fun of her. I mean, I acted in a totally abominable fashion. I made light of 
this awful crisis in a woman's life when a very womanliness is threatened. I didn't give her any love and sympathy, and I felt, as I was sober and sober, I got. I felt this was an unpardonable sin that I couldn't ever wipe out. I hadn't been working the steps yet. I was struggling with the first three. And as I was having a tuna fish sandwich and milk one day, my sponsor called and says, get over to UCLA Hospital, Charlie Tannen. He was a guy who had brought me together with my sponsor. He's in the hospital. His wife is having a hysterectomy. He's got no, you're his only friend in AA. Go there with him. So I wasn't sure how to drive. I'd get in the car. I didn't. And I said, I'll go as soon as I finish the sandwich. He says, go now at once. And he had me conditioned. I jumped when he said anything. I said, yes, sir. Like the Marine Corps. And I left the sandwich there. That was not like me. And the milk, hungry, get into the car. I shoot over to UCLA. It's about a 30-minute drive. I get lost. I park. I have to race around locating this. And I find Charlie Tannen in the visitor's room walking nervously back and forth. And I act in ways I never acted before. Nobody gave me instructions. I put my arm around him. I try to comfort him. And as I'm um, doing this, I see his wife being wheeled out on a gurney. She's had her surgery. And I walked along beside the gurney and followed her. And as she was put into bed, I was there, and I put my arm around her um, and said, it'll be all right. You'll find everything will be all right. And it won't affect your sex life with Charlie. I don't know what made me reassure about that. But I knew that having a hysterectomy doesn't affect a woman's sex desires. In fact, it may even increase it. So, uh, and I re had been reassuring Charlie in the same regard. Because somehow that area of our life has more to do with sex. It has mo much more to do with our essential meaning on this earth. I think one of the reasons we're put on this earth is to uh, multiply to continue the chain of life, of being, the great chain of being. And it's one of our great services, by the way. Anyway, and I had a tremendous spiritual bouleversement, to use a French word. Those of you that don't know French, it's just it's your tough luck. Bouleversement. <laughs> In me. And when I got back to the house, I called Clancy. And I said, Clancy, how does it help Charlotte? I suddenly forget Mrs. Tannen's first name. It just slipped my mind. I said, how does it help make amends to Charlotte if I'm nice to Mrs. Tannen? I told him this whole incident. And he said something which is very unclancy-ish. It should more come from Chuck Chamberlain. Because Clancy, those of you that have heard him, he's a hard-bitten, tough guy. In those days, he didn't even say the Lord's Prayer. He would clasp his hands like this up. Wouldn't do it. He now says the Lord's Prayer. I think he even believes in the Lord. And uh, he said, when I said, how does that make amends to Charlotte? He said, sometimes we make amends to the universe. What a concept that was. What a powerful mystical concept. I never heard him utter another mystical phrase again, and I've been my sponsor. <laughs> And sometimes we do have to... I, my parents have, were both dead before I came to the program. I was once asked when I expressed this thing to the, about the universe, a woman came up to me and said in all seriousness, how can I make amends to my dead dog? I was very cruel to him while he was alive. He's dead now and I'm sober. And I said immediately, be nice to every dog you meet, whether it's a stray animal or in somebody's house. Now, don't laugh at that. That's how one of the ways we make amends is acting differently. And uh, I try to be nice to every older man and woman I meet. Of course, as I get older, I meet very few men and women who are older than me. So I try to be nice to middle-aged men and women. And even younger men and women, I'm not prejudiced against them. But And that's how you make amends to the universe. It's not that difficult. And... Um, uh, that was another great, that was a great milestone for me, a tremendous milestone in living AA. It's not just a set of steps that you read and memorize. It was an action. It's not never, you, you can read the big book backwards and forwards, which I have read, forwards at least, not backwards, but forwards, um, several times. 
and uh, it doesn't say anything be sure to visit friends of yours whose wives are having hysterectomies <laughs> there's not one reference to hysterectomy altogether for that matter but it was a tremendous mystical experience for me because it showed how nothing no matter how wretched or evil I had done or thought I had done could not be made better through this fellowship and the actions and things we do and another thing happened a little while well, a few months later Clancy fell it was time that I write my inventory people are putting their coats on should I take that as a hint <laughs> God and uh, I'll tell two more and then I'll wind up and uh, he said I want you to go back and make amends to Charlotte and the amends are going to be you're going to just listen don't talk she's going to and he arranged with her she'd leave the office and I came there and I listened and after a few hours of listening and not answering back or making excuses or arguing I was crazy and I wanted to come back and he said well if you can't stand another day then come back but I stood in another day and I listened to her tell all her things for a week and then I went and heard my son tell his thing he's more laconic but he told me a few things and then I went down to Arkansas where my daughter lives and she told me and I listened and listening is a great spiritual act listening is, one, is a spiritual act you can start practicing now because I believe any act is spiritual in which you put the other person's needs ahead of your own not even on the same level ahead of your own and when you listen really listen to somebody whether it's somebody that you meet in, on a plane or a train or a, in a store or an AA meeting and instead of rushing in with your own statements it's a tremendous spiritual act and he and I learned the spiritual act on that occasion and of course another spiritual act I learned was work because my sponsor drove me to work and nobody can be a whole person if he doesn't work because work is a way of giving back to the universe what we receive from God and uh, that's why good sponsors uh, uh, always try to get, get their men and women to find useful gainful employment and do something not only to pay the rent and to buy food but to return back to keep this chain of of existence going not just to take but to give and of course and the third thing I learned in my early years of sobriety was paying debts I owed over thirty two thousand dollars when I came in there. well I owed actually over twenty thousand but was something I'm going to tell you in the last thing uh, it rose up and I didn't it took and I, during the first I didn't start paying off these debts until I was about four years sober but I began paying them off the thought of personal bankruptcy never, never entered into our discussion and it wasn't until my tenth year of sobriety that I, I paid every cent off but I did and uh, paying debts back before you buy things for yourself it's a very spiritual act obviously and it, it as a result was I drove the same car I had the same lousy stereo set and I didn't buy I bought very few clothes for 10 years new clothes hardly any and of course by the time I paid all the debts back I truly deep down had lost interest in material acquisitions it was an amazing spiritual transformation I didn't need the fix that buying a new car or a new suit gives a person because it's only a momentary thrill, that moment of acquisition and after that a Porsche 911 or whatever your car is or a Bugatti if you're a collector it's another automobile, a pain in the neck, the upkeep, the theft, the bumps and things <laughs> a suit is a suit after a while I've got three suits, they're all gray, they're all three or more years old one is light for hot weather another is medium for medium weather another is heavier for heavy weather <laughs> same thing I this ties a Father's Day present of my son five years ago it's uh it's funny I, I, I remember once when I spoke to this effect about money and clothes a very attractive woman came up to me and said can I even spend some money on, on some new spring clothes I didn't know what to say. I didn't have the heart to say, no, you got to spend, pay your debts back. She's so attractive. Look. I said, well, have you got a sponsor? I said, yes. I said, well, ask your sponsor. I put it off on the sponsor. 
Now let me tell you one of the most dramatic days of my life, and then I will end so that everybody can clear away this place and you'll have a dance or maybe having the dance somewhere else. <coughs> and um, I wanted to commit suicide in my second year of sobriety because I'd been doing everything that I was told to do, and my condition was getting worse and worse and worse. I couldn't earn any money. and just I had an experience with United California Bank was where I had my pathetic, meager amounts of money. And remember, I was a man once who lived high, who earned big sums of money, who spent big, who traveled first class everywhere, who was used to being waited on by fawning press agents because I commanded power in the media. And I wrote a $10 check to a Mayfair market, and it came back on a Saturday marked insufficient funds. So on Sunday, I was so humiliated by this. Also, the last, I used to have custom-made suits custom-made buttonholes. You may not know this, but to a, through a two Bo Brummel, you never wear a suit with either fake buttonholes or no buttonholes on the sleeve. They should be able to be unbuttoned. And it was fashionable when I was a dude that you unbutton the bottom button if you had three or four. And of course, everything was custom-made. And in those days, I would spend four or five hundred dollars on a suit. Nowadays, I understand people spend sixteen hundred or two thousand on a suit, but that was a hell of a lot of money back then. And I had gold cufflinks. I wouldn't wear a shirt that wasn't French cuffs. That'll give you an idea of my sense of values. And anyway, uh, and here I am. I, I can't meet a lousy ten bucks. And my the last pair of trousers, of the matching trousers of my last custom-made elegant suit had worn out, had holes in it. And every decent pair of trousers I had had holes in it. I didn't have an, an unholy set of pants in my whole trousers. <laughs> and I just felt a total, I mean, a nobody, instead of getting better, my, my life was a total humiliation. I decided the only way out of suicide. And I went to see my sponsor on Sunday, and I told him of my defeats. And he said, uh, oh, and I was three months behind on the rent and the car payment. And he said, well, look, he was having a, one of his rare at days with his family, and he had going to barbecue something, and he was obviously anxious to get rid of me. And he said, look... If you want to kill yourself, it's a, it was in February. It's a nice day for a suicide. So the weather was nice, but cool. It's a good day. You're going to kill. You don't want too warm a day when it's humid. You don't want too cold a day. A nice temperate day. Is, I said, yeah, I can see that. He said, so go kill yourself. But just leave my yard, and I didn't get back to my family. So I started walking out of the yard. And now I'm saying, even he wants to get rid of me. He'll be sorry when I really kill myself. Yeah, they'll all be sorry. They'll all... And on and on. And as I was almost leaving his backyard, he said, By the way, if you change your mind, why don't you go to UCB in the morning and uh, see what... Find out why are they uh, charging you this? In those days, I think a, 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 for a check return was a mere $3. I think it's more now. UCB was later taken over by First Interstate, which Martin is connected with. Uh, so it's sort of a First Interstate. And go the, down to them bank, find out. And then he said, why don't you go to Ford Motor Credit Company, refinance your car. Maybe that you can get lower monthly payments, $92 a month. You're not meaning it. And, uh, but if you want to kill yourself, look, that solves all your problems, and goodbye. So he... <laughs> I decided not to kill myself. I gave it another day. I had no food in the house. I went without dinner that night. And I just chewed on my resentments. And uh, resentment is a hard thing to swallow because it's indigestible, as we all know. And a very indigestible dinner, believe me. And a restless night because I had to live. I had to wake up and start it all over again. Another day of problems and troubles and... But at 10 o'clock, I went to the branch of UCB. It's a few blocks from where I live. Had a Ford Maverick, drove it down there. And uh, 
I asked to see a, an officer, a vice, vice, vice president, sat at his desk, and I showed him this thing, $10 thing. He said, well, one minute, let me check on it. I said, I'm sure I had $10 in the bank. And he came back smiling and says, uh, huh. well, actually, you'd been several times, your account was so low, we had, we had to take service charges out, and you actually have $9.30 in the bank. And I tell you what I'll do. We'll wipe out this penalty charge. I guess they don't do that anymore. They just, they do. <laughs> wipe out the $3 charge, because if otherwise, they're only going to put through the check again. You'll get stuck with another one. Now, you give me 70, uh, you give me 70 cents, and we'll make the check good. And I know someday you're going to have lots of money in this bank. Well, I didn't have to open my wallet and look for folding money because I knew I didn't have even one dollar in this whole wallet. But I fiddled around. I took out a whole bunch of change, and I began counting the quarters, the nickels, the dimes, the pennies. I could not come up with 70 cents. I mean, that is about as low financially as I've sunk in my entire life in front of this vice president of a big UCB bank. And you know what this man did? He patted me on the shoulder and says, it's all right. I'll make good on We'll make good on the check. Someday, I know you're going to have a lot of money. Now, I mean, that's, that's really incredible for a, a bank officer to do. I still have my account in the bank. And I must say, I don't have big sums of money, but I have a nice five-figure market interest account, and I have a healthy regular checking account, and I wouldn't think of banking at another bank because of that alone for that. I mean, that's incredible. And then I went over to an AA meeting, and I had my first nutrition of the day, uh, a donut and coffee, not recommended by people who believe in healthy diets, but believe me, that tasted better than the banquet tonight. <laughs> I'm not putting down the bank. <laughs> it was a good steak. I tell you, I used to go without food so much, and I'm formerly a guy that was a strictly a caviar and champagne person, and breast of guinea and under glass and all of half fancy haute cuisine. Uh, and I was grateful for Mc on the rare occasions when I could afford a McDonald's hamburger. It was a big event in my first two years of sobriety. And I, and I didn't even know how to drive to Ford Motor Credit Company in Torrance. And somebody gave me driving directions at this meeting, and I go driving. And along the way, now I'm really getting hungry, I pass Carl Jr.'s and Taco Bell. And it just seemed like every store, every shop was a food emporium or a restaurant. Or, and I was just, and I knew I could, I didn't have enough to, to buy a hamburger even. And finally I get the Ford Motor. My, my sponsor had told me, don't borrow any money, just refinance the loan. I come into this place. He asks me the mileage on the car, and I tell him. He says, don't worry. We can lend you how much you need. $500, we'll lend it to you. I said, no, I don't want any money. Just refinance it. You, I don't want to take any money from you today. And he begins doing numbers and numbers and numbers. He says, well, I can get your payments down to about $31 a week, but I've got to give you something to make it even. I've got to give you a check for $46.80. I said, you mean you have to? You must? He said, otherwise it won't work out. I said, you mean it'll make you feel better and your accounts will be better? Yes, yes. I said, I said, well, then you forced me to take it, I'll tell you. And he did. He gave me that check. That all happened on one day. And then when I came home, I found a letter from my agent. And the letter said, uh... Dear Maurice, we got your letter, and we're glad you stopped drinking. We, meaning him and Fred Schwade, my editor, and Simon Schuster, who later became chairman of the board, now chairman emeritus, and they've decided to take a chance on you. They're going to send you a thousand dollars a month for six months, and if you can produce enough good pages, they will keep financing you till you finish the book. I mean, unbelievable. I hadn't even wanted to write that letter. And I tell you, I just didn't get down on my knees and thank God. I melted down on my knees. I sort of, I couldn't absorb 
the events that had happened in one day that's and when the day before I had wanted to kill myself and here was a miraculous day that's why you hear people say again and again don't leave don't start drinking or don't kill yourself five minutes before the miracle because you don't know when it's going to happen and it happened to me and I began to write that book and they began sending me money and the book was finally published and became very successful and I remember once my sponsor bought a copy of it for Chuck C and we gave it and he gave it to him at a Palm Springs Roundup I remember sitting with Chuck and Elsa and that's when Elsa told me about her knowing John Wayne as a young man and teaching him acting or being involved in an acting class with him or something like that and I was to write other books and uh, I had never believed any of these things possible I could go on and on and on with one thing after another but uh, I think these things illustrate the mystical fabric of the universe there seemed to me to be two maybe there are many worlds one is a world of cause and effect of our five senses in which we live in and in which we <coughs> move in most of the time but then there's another world another fabric of the universe God's world which is often expressed through coincidences of one sort or another through seemingly miraculous happenings that were unexpected our lives are saved our lives are given back to us and th these are signs of God's presence in the universe and I can to this I will never forget the way Chuck C would say God in whom we live and move and have our being I wish I could say it the way he says it that is that other fabric and that is a real universe in which I have become a part of and in which I live and move I, and have my being because of this fellowship and because of Alcoholics Anonymous and you people. Thank you. Thank you.